Hi all, welcome to this, the first video in our last topic that's going to be looking into rural geography. Now one quick apology before the video gets going, I did mean to put this up last night, some of you might have noticed actually that a video did go up last night, um, but tech issues with audio, things like that, meant I had to take it back down. So hopefully this time it's going to work and let's get going. So a quick overview of the rural topic. Uh, in rural, we really focus on two case studies. So we're going to be looking at the Great Plains in the USA, and we're going to be looking at Kerala in India. Now, each of these areas focuses on a separate type of farming. So in the Great Plains, we have extensive commercial agriculture, and in Kerala, we have intensive peasant agriculture. Now, the big thing that we look at with both of these is the changes that's happened as the farming system has developed with time. So with the Great Plains, we look at the rise of organic farming, genetically modified crops, biofuels, things like that. And in Kerala, we look at some, some very similar things, but we, kind of, we look at it very slightly differently. We look at it as part of a package of reforms that form something called the Green Revolution. So let's get started and let's start looking at our first case study, which is going to be extensive commercial, agri com extensive commercial agriculture. And we're looking at the Great Plains in the USA. Now, to start us off, a little bit of context. Where is the Great Plains? You know, I've said the USA. Uh, and even saying that's slightly incorrect, the Great Plains region stretches in its northernmost extent uh, from Canada. And as you can see in this map, it just kind of nudges very slightly into Mexico, with the bulk of it obviously spread throughout the entire kind of continental USA. Now, what impact does this have? One, the climate is hugely varied. You know, we are covering a huge area. Uh, you know, we're almost on a kind of continental scale here. So the climate is varied. In the north, it's much cooler. And in the south, it obviously gets warmer. One of the ones that's slightly less obvious is in the west, uh, the Great Plains is dry, it's semi-arid. We're almost in kind of desert-like conditions in the west. And as we go to, as we go to the east, it gets wetter and wetter. Now, the land itself is pretty flat throughout. You know, there are some areas of, you know, very small hills and mountains, um, particularly as you head west and you start to get closer towards where the Rockies are. But even then, you know, we are talking foothills at best and it's a very flat region. Now, something that is reasonably common in large areas of the Great Plains is that it can suffer from drought. And something historically that we're going to talk about in a moment is some of the dust storms that, this, that these droughts have caused over the years. So, you know, a little bit of history, a little bit of thinking about the land uses that we commonly see in the Great Plains. Now, historically, uh, you know, Native Americans inhabited the majority um, of the North American continent, and in the Great Plains region, they farmed bison. Now, as we went through history and European settlers arrived, they drove the Native Americans off the land and they replaced them with farms that were raising livestock, largely cattle, uh, and arable farms as well. Now, as we move into the early 20th century, we get a combination of some really bad years of drought, and we've got some really questionable farming practices, which have resulted in huge dust storms. Now, I mentioned these earlier. The really important thing to think about when we talk about these dust storms is, you know, literally, what is it? And more importantly, where is the dust coming from? Now, the dust in the, these cases is actually the topsoil from the area. So if you have drought for a long time, you've all seen what happens to soil when it dries out. It dries out, it cracks, and it can, you know, splinter down into really, really fine dust particles. If you've got a really big, flat area, and you don't have a lot of trees or bushes or anything like that to help try and protect this really loose, dry soil, when you get winds blowing through, which again, very, very common, in the Great Plains region, it whips up all of that dried out topsoil and you get a dust storm. Now, because of this, you actually seen this area losing a huge amount of its topsoil, which had a huge impact on the general fertility of the area. Because of this, lots of people left the region because farming just wasn't profitable, it wasn't practical in a huge amount of the Great Plains at the turn of the 20th century. This rural depopulation, oddly enough, allowed the farms that did remain to get even bigger. And that's been the kind of the, the predecessor, the precursor to some of the huge sizes of the farms that we see today. 
Now today the population of the Great Plains is still really low and for the people who do live there, I mean, the vast majority of them live in urban areas. And to give you a little bit of context, that's le that's you know less than 30% of the land area in the Great Plains because 70% of it is used for farming. So that just gives you an idea of how much of the land there is, uh, or how much of the land there is being used for this particular land use, uh, and basically how empty the Great Plains can be a lot of the time. So if we think about the, the farming systems that we actually see here, now again, it varies. We've already said you know, the Great Plains is massive. Now over in the west, uh, where it's a little bit more arid, uh, we've got a lot of cattle ranching. You know, cows are a little bit hardier, they can cope a little bit better uh, in, in the kind of semi-arid conditions. And as we go east, where it gets a little bit wetter, we start to see arable farms growing crops, very particularly wheat, cotton, barley, hay, corn, soybeans, those are a variety of things that these farms grow. Now, all of this farming is both extensive and commercial. We mentioned at the start of the video that this is called extensive commercial agriculture. And the reason for that is, one, it's extensive because the farms are massive. They extend over a huge area. They average out at 400 hectares, which, you know, to give you a comparator for that, that's about 400 football pitches per farm. Now, some of them get bigger than that as well. You know, particularly some of the really, really huge cattle ranches. They, they can be absolutely phenomenal in size. Now, the reason they're so large, one, the soil is fairly poor, as we've already said, and you need a large area then to turn a profit. We're talking about you know, economies of scale here. You're generating that much of a product that you can afford to sell it quite cheap, but still make money off it. Also, this is helped by the fact that the land's so cheap. You know, again, we've talked about how we had huge rural depopulation. People moved away from the area. And basically, we're trying to get rid of the land for as little as possible. You know, they were willing to sell it for very, very little. So that, again, it leads you to having a lot of land that you can use to produce things so it's quite cheap. Now, if it's commercial, and that's reasonably straightforward with commercial, we're talking about the idea that all of the produce, all of the livestock that's reared here is going to be sold on to turn a profit. Uh, you know, farming in this region relies really heavily on things like machinery, and one of the reasons it relies so heavily on machinery is machinery is cheaper than human labour. Thus, your profit margin can be greater. Uh, and two, the actual geography of the area, the fact that it's so flat, lends itself really well to using a lot of machinery. Now, this slide is a really good place to hit pause and just sit and have a look at this and maybe take some notes and digest some of it. But these are some of the kind of general, general, sorry, changes that we've seen in the Great Plains. Some of the reasons why we see them and some kind of specific examples of where these things have happened. So some of the changes we're talking about, the farms have got bigger. I've already spoken about that. This increases the output of the farm, the actual amount of uh, you know, cows that it can rear or the amount of crops it can grow. And it happens because the land is fairly cheap. Now we have been seeing as we move you know, through the 20th century into the 21st century, uh, new technology being utilised. Uh, and we do this because it means the farm's more efficient and it does help us to combat soil erosion in a lot of places. And the kinds of things we're talking about is, you know, using satellites to, to navigate where we should be spraying pesticides and insecticides, uh, using them to figure out exactly where crops need to be irrigated and how much water they require. And even in some places using, you know, laser levelling of the land so that the, the machinery we want to run in the land can be used as efficiently as possible. We also improve the actual methods we use to farm. And again, this is largely done to combat soil erosion. But we're talking about doing things like when we plough a field, we do contour ploughing, which means we follow the contours, we follow the natural shape of the land, and it stops soil being blown away. Equally, if we cultivate in strips, so rather than clearing a whole field all at once, we do it in stripes. So the crops that are left protect the bare soil between them. Uh, you know, intercropping is just good for the soil. Uh, having different crops growing in the same field helps the soil to, to retain some of its uh, some of its nutrients and helps to make the soil more fertile. Uh, and irrigation just in general because the, the, the region needs to be irrigated. Uh, we've also seen an increase in the amount of livestock being reared. As we said, as you go into this kind of semi-arid regions, we see more livestock because they can cope better with those conditions. Now, you know, the short version of this is crops can be really unreliable 
if the weather is temperamental. So the more animals you have, the more reliable your income is. Also, the more animals you have, the more land you need to leave as grass for pasture for the animals to feed. And that tends to be quite good at slowing soil erosion as well. I've seen the crops growing be changed up, be varied a lot more. Uh, and this is, you know, us developing, uh, you know, agriculture as a science developing where we understand what crops are actually better at growing in what conditions. Um, government funding, the US government is, you know, very keen to make sure that if it comes to it, they can be self-sufficient in food production. So they do provide money to farmers in the region to make sure that that is, you know, more of a reality. Uh, and we also see something we're going to talk about in a moment in a bit more detail, an increase in biofuel production. Now, you know, I'm going to jump straight into the biofuel stuff. So first, what is biofuels? Now, it's a more environmentally friendly uh, alternative to petrol and diesel. Uh, we make it from, you know, corn, sugarcane, rapeseed, which we ferment to produce ethanol, which we can then burn in engines. Um, now, the US government puts targets in place every single year for how much biofuel they want to see produced. And as you know, a quick example, in 2012, the target was 59 billion litres, and there was a stipulation put in that 40% of all of the corn grown in the US should be used to make biofuel. So, you know, it's something that's, that's reasonably important. Now, pros and cons. And I'm going to start to pick up the pace a wee bit because we are running out tight and tight. So, pros of biofuel. It saves the USA money because you create fuel rather than importing it. It's a big employer. It brings people in. It makes billions of dollars a year. Now, there's a typo here. In North Dakota alone, it makes $300 million a year, not just $300. Uh, the, the profitability of the farms overall is improved and the farms are less polluting. Oh, sorry, the, the fuel is less polluting than fossil fuels. The cons, it increases the demand for the crops, so things like corn, and that affects the price you pay not just for corn to make biofuel, but for the price you pay to eat corn, to actually buy it and to eat. Now, some of these crops, particularly corn, is also used to feed livestock, so the price of meat and dairy can also go up. Uh, Corn requires a huge amount of irrigation, so as we've already said, areas in the Great Plains really struggle with water, so we're using a very valuable resource much more aggressively, and we need a lot of fertilizers, which can have a negative impact on the environment. Now, next one, GM crops. Now, these are plants that we modify for a variety of reasons, like better yields or a resistance to diseases and pests, but they can be reasonably controversial because some people are worried about health risks associated with them. So again, pros and cons. So, you know, pros, they can tolerate drought, low temperatures, disease, pests. They've got higher yields. It allows you to grow different varieties of crops. All of these good things. The cons, there are health concerns because we don't really know what will happen as we continue to use these. The seeds themselves are expensive. So there's a concern that we'll see more uh, divergence in terms of, you know, rich farmers can have super seeds and poor farmers can't. So the rich get richer. The crops could damage other organisms in an ecosystem. Again, some of these crops we've not had out in the wild for uh, any particular length of time yet, so we don't know what the consequences might be. And one of the big things, you know, resistance to pests. Uh, insects could become immune to them, which limits some of the usefulness. Now, last bit here, and I know I'm going quick, guys, but stick with me. So, organic farming. Now, I'm going to say most of you will know what organic farming is, but it's the idea of doing livestock or arable farming and not using any synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, hormones, antibiotics, whatever. Nothing artificial gets used. Now, the good side of this, some people say the stuff tastes better. We are talking about food for the most part, after all. It stops people eating as many chemicals as a system. It's very sustainable. It reduces the need to produce these synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, which you combine that with an overall lowering of air and water pollution. It's good for the environment. Downside, the food is more expensive. Is there a market for it? You could argue, yes, there is. Organic food's been around for a while now, but there is still a concern over its profitability. It's extremely labour intensive. It eliminates the use of GM crops and it's time consuming. And all of that adds to that expense in making these crops cost more. Right, we're going to call time there, guys. Uh, and I'll see you in the next video on intensive peasant agriculture. Goodbye.